The first time I saw that stretch of road was the day I nearly lost my life. Living in a small and quiet town like Holloway, Montana, a good part of your life is spent driving. Driving to the nearest grocery store, driving to the post office, just driving for the most part. For me, driving offered a sense of tranquility. The forgotten roads snaking through the vast expanses of farmland and forests provided hours of peaceful solitude. That night, however, would be the exception to the rule. I had just wrapped up an exhilarating day of shooting an advertisement campaign for a local bed and breakfast. As a freelance copywriter and digital marketer, I often found myself in unfamiliar settings. Yet my experience that day could hardly have prepared me for what was to unfold before me. The sun had long been swallowed by the horizon as I climbed into my car, eager to return to the comfort of my home. The quickest route home was through the dense forest of Lake Maddox, a thick cluster of imposing trees concealing an untouched body of water. It was said that the lake had been named after the unfortunate demise of a logger named Richard Maddox back in the late 1800s. The locals would sometimes whisper about his restless spirit, but I had never been one to buy into ghost stories. The road was narrow and sinuous, a sliver of tarmac that snaked through the impenetrable darkness. My headlights struggled to pierce the inky blackness only managing to reveal glimpses of gnarled branches reaching out, as if threatening to pull me into the woods. It was on a particularly sharp bend that I first caught sight of it, a timid flicker of light that danced just beyond the tree line. My curiosity was piqued, and I slowed the car to a crawl. As I approached the source of the mysterious glow, I could make out the outline of a solitary house hidden among the trees. The windows were boarded up, and the sagging roof suggested a long history of disrepair. Probably just some kids playing with fire. I muttered under my breath. However, my gut told me that something was off. The feeling of unease grew stronger with each passing second, urging me to put distance between the house and me. As I prepared to get back on the road, I caught a glimpse of a figure out of the corner of my eye. A woman stood on the porch, her features illuminated by the eerie light. She appeared to be in her late thirties, her dark hair tangled and disheveled. Hey, are you okay? I called out to her, my voice tinged with concern. The woman made no reply, instead fixing me with a penetrating stare. Without warning, she turned and disappeared into the darkness of the house. A chill crawled up my spine, as if someone had walked over my grave. I knew I should have driven off, leaving the decrepit house and its strange occupant far behind. But I felt compelled to follow her, my mind consumed by the twisted curiosity that had grabbed hold of me like a vice. Stepping out of my car, I approached the house with trepidation. The closer I got, the more the woman's gaze seemed to linger on me, a shadowy memory that refused to fade. It took every ounce of courage in me to push open the creaky door and step into the darkness. The house was filled with the stench of decay, an oppressive odor that clung to my clothes and hair. I stumbled blindly through the gloom, guided only by the faint glow of my cell phone's flashlight. Suddenly, a door slammed behind me, and I found myself in a small room filled with dusty, broken furniture. My heart raced with a mixture of fear and adrenaline as I scrambled to find an exit. Help me! A desperate whisper filled the room, the woman's voice fragile and trembling. I hesitated, torn between the instinct to flee and the fear of leaving her behind. Where are you? I shouted hoping the echo would carry my voice to her. Down here, she replied, her voice barely audible through the floorboards. 
As I stepped closer to the sound, the floor gave way beneath me, sending me tumbling into a hidden chamber below. My head throbbed with pain as my vision blurred, the dusty air clouding my senses. I tried to regain my bearings, but the room seemed to spin and sway around me. Thank you for finding me, whispered the woman, her voice suddenly calm and collected. What? Who are you? I stammered, trying to piece together the situation. As my vision finally cleared, I saw her standing by a wall lined with rusted, ancient tools. She picked up a tarnished axe, the metallic glint catching my eye. I felt a shiver run down my spine as my mind raced to comprehend the danger I was in. My name is Madeline Maddox, she said, her face twisted into a sinister smile. And you're not leaving this place alive. The horror hit me like a freight train. I was trapped in the lair of a vengeful spirit, unwittingly lured to my demise. I tried to move, to claw my way out of the hellish chamber, but my body refused to obey. Madeline raised the axe above her head, the dim light casting a macabre shadow on the wall behind her. As the blade began its descent, I squeezed my eyes shut, bracing for the end. But the blow never came. Instead, I heard the sound of shattering glass and a high-pitched scream. When I finally dared to open my eyes, Madeline was gone, replaced by the imposing figure of Richard Maddox, his spectral form silhouetted against the moonlight filtering through the broken window. He was holding the axe, his eyes filled with a cold, vengeful rage. Leave now, he bellowed, his voice echoing through the chamber like a clap of thunder. I will not let her take another life. I didn't need to be told twice. I scrambled to my feet, my legs trembling and weak, and stumbled towards the shattered window. The jagged glass tore at my clothes as I clambered through, but the pain was a welcome reminder that I was still alive. As I made my way back to my car, I could hear the ghostly wails of Madeline and Richard. Their voices mingled with the howling wind, a chilling reminder of the darkness I had narrowly escaped. I fumbled with my keys, my hands shaking uncontrollably, and finally managed to start the engine. As I drove away, I couldn't help but glance back at the decrepit house the terrifying events that had unfolded feeling surreal and impossible. Days later, I found myself unable to shake the haunting memory of that night. I decided to do some research on the house and its former inhabitants. I discovered that Madeline and Richard Maddox had lived there in the early 20th century. Madeline had been accused of witchcraft and was rumored to have murdered several people. Richard, her husband, had tried to protect her from the angry townsfolk, but they had ultimately burned her at the stake, while Richard was left to die of his wounds in the very room where I had encountered them. As I delved deeper into the story, I found an old newspaper article that described the final moments before Madeline's execution. It was said that she had cursed the townspeople vowing to return and exact her revenge on anyone who dared to enter her home. I couldn't help but shudder as I remembered my near-death experience in that forsaken house, realizing that I had almost become another victim of Madeline's wrath. It was only thanks to Richard's intervention that I had escaped with my life. In a strange, twisted way, Richard had saved me, the man who had once tried to protect the very woman who had almost killed me. It was a chilling thought, one that would stay with me for the rest of my life. As time passed, the memory of that night slowly faded, leaving behind a lingering unease that I could never quite shake. But the story of Madeline and Richard Maddox remained, a grim reminder that some things are better left undisturbed. And though I would never know why Richard chose to save me that night, I couldn't help but feel grateful for his intervention. In the end, it was his act of redemption that allowed me to live to tell the tale, a chilling, 
haunting tale that would become the stuff of legend. A tale that would keep listeners on the edge of their seats, their hearts pounding with fear, as they questioned what truly lies beyond the veil of our world. It wasn't often that I drove along the desolate roads of the Nevada desert, but when my childhood friend, Hannah Howell, went missing, I couldn't resist the urge to help. The last known location of her broken-down car had been near a ghost town called Quinton, and I had to find her before it was too late. As I drove through the night, the full moon hung ominously above me, casting eerie, elongated shadows across the desert landscape. I could feel the isolation, the inexplicable dread gnawing at my insides, but my determination to find Hannah outweighed my fears. After what seemed like hours, my headlights illuminated a road sign. Quinton, 10 miles. I switched on the radio, hoping to find solace in the sound of another human voice. Instead, I was greeted by a crackling noise, faint whisperings of a conversation long gone. My hands gripped the steering wheel tighter, my knuckles white with tension. Soon, the dilapidated buildings of Quinton came into view. It was said the town had been abandoned decades ago, when the gold mines ran dry. I pulled up in front of the old saloon and stepped out of the car, its door letting out an agonizing creak. Hello? My voice faltered, bouncing off the weathered walls. Hannah? Are you here? Silence answered me. I knew I wasn't alone, though. The hairs on the back of my neck stood up, and the once reassuring presence of the moon now seemed mocking. As I cautiously walked through the ghost town, I noticed an old truck parked behind the saloon. The rusted vehicle seemed out of place and my heart began to race at the thought of what it might mean. That's when I heard it, the faint sound of someone crying. I followed the sobs to a boarded-up building, and my gut told me I'd find Hannah inside. I forced the rotting boards off the entrance and stepped into the darkness. There she was, tied up in a corner, eyes swollen from tears. J. James? Is that really you? Hannah stuttered, her tone filled with equal parts fear and hope. Yes, it's me, I assured her, working hastily to untie her bindings. You're going to be okay. As I finally freed her from her restraints, the faint sound of footsteps echoing outside sent a shiver down my spine. We had to leave, and we had to leave right now. Hannah, we need to go. I urged, helping her to her feet. Someone's coming. Together, we stumbled back towards my car, but as we reached the saloon, a figure emerged from the shadows. A man in his fifties, his unkempt beard crawling with a sinister smile, stood between us and the vehicle. My name's Albert Dugan, he said in a gravelly voice, and I reckon you two are trespassing. A sense of overwhelming dread washed over me. This man, Albert Dugan, was the reason we were here. He was the reason Hannah had vanished. He was the one who had haunted the whispers of the radio. I don't want any trouble, I said, my voice barely a whisper. Just let us leave, and we'll pretend this never happened. Albert chuckled, and I could see his disturbing grin widen. I wish it was that simple, son. You see, I'm a collector of sorts, and Hannah happens to be my latest acquisition. Fear turned to fury inside me as I clenched my fists. You're insane, I spat. We won't be a part of your twisted collection. Well, you don't really have a choice, do you? Albert sneered, his gaze flitting from me to Hannah. 
But in that moment, amidst the terror and despair, I remembered a childhood game Hannah and I used to play. We developed secret codes to communicate, stumping our parents and the neighborhood kids alike. And there, in the midst of chaos, a plan was born. I looked at Hannah, whispering the code we'd created years ago, hoping she'd understand. Her eyes met mine, and as the memories of our friendship washed over her, a subtle nod confirmed she'd understood. With a deep breath, I lunged at Albert, catching him off guard. As he stumbled backward, Hannah took her chance, racing towards the car. I didn't have much time. Go, Hannah! Go! I shouted, holding Albert back as best as I could. In one swift motion, she climbed into the driver's seat and started the engine. Albert's eyes widened as he realized what was happening. He pushed me off, trying to race towards the car, but it was too late. Hannah had slammed her foot on the accelerator, and the car roared to life, crashing into Albert and pinning him against the saloon's wall. Without wasting a second, I jumped into the passenger seat, and we sped off into the night. We were free. We were alive. As we disappeared into the darkness, Albert Dugan's voice echoed through the ghost town, an agonizing scream that would haunt the desolate land for years to come. We never spoke of that night again, but the bond we'd shared as children, the unbreakable connection between us, had saved our lives. And as we drove away, leaving Quinton and Albert Dugan in our rearview mirror, the chilling moon faded into the horizon, yielding to the first light of a new day. Driving at night always gave me an incomprehensible adrenaline rush. Maybe it was the undeniable power of a machine's roaring engine, that kinetic push down empty highways or perhaps the sinister tendency of darkness to swallow the world whole, leaving only the car's headlights as a lifeline against the impending abyss. Whatever it was, night driving had become my solace. My name is Aiden Pierce and I work as a criminal defense attorney for a renowned law firm situated in El Paso, Texas. The high-profile cases I handle tend to leave me wound up, consumed by the desire to loosen my taut nerves with a late-night drive. I had just won a particularly draining case defending Martin Downey, the man acquitted for the murder of his wife, a decision that left the whole town seething with anger. It was during one of these ritual drives when I found myself on a remote stretch of Route 8 that cut through the desert. The moon cast an eerie pallor over the landscape, revealing only rolling sands and the occasional shrubbery. The desolate surroundings were surprisingly calming, like the stillness of the night was wrapping me in a comforting embrace. As I delved deeper into this ethereal realm, the car's radio seemed to sing louder uncontrollably, in the face of the quietude. I could feel the hair stand on my neck and my grip tighten on the wheel as the road ahead seemed to spiral into nothingness. The mysterious thrill of the night had struck me once again. It was then that I spotted a figure on the side of the road, their outline barely visible in the dim moonlight. A young woman, clad in a tattered red dress and sporting a disheveled mane of jet black hair, stretched out her arm, signaling me to stop. My mind raced with the possibilities. Was she the victim of a car accident, a stranded traveler, or an illusory figment of my imagination? Torn between the weighty lens of skepticism and the urgency of her plea, I hesitantly pulled over. Her eyes, wild with fear, seemed to bore into me as the car rolled to a stop. She opened her mouth as if to utter a desperate cry for help, but instead, 
managed a faint whisper, her breath quivering with dread. Please, I need your help. What happened? I asked, my voice masking a quiver of trepidation. My name's Abigail Whitmore. She began, voice shaky as she glanced over her shoulder. I need to get to the nearest police station. It's a matter of life and death. Her words gripped my heart like a vice, and without another thought, I unlocked the car, allowing her in. As she settled into the passenger seat, I noticed a small gash on her forehead, the drying blood serving as the only color on her pale face. What happened to you, Abigail? I asked, pressing the gas pedal as we accelerated into the night. You wouldn't believe me if I told you, she muttered her eyes darting to the rearview mirror. I'm an attorney. I'm trained to listen, I replied, casting her a reassuring glance. She took a deep breath and began narrating her harrowing story. Abigail had been driving home when a sudden need for fuel led her to a desolate gas station at the edge of Route 8. After topping off her tank, she walked into the gas station's convenience store hoping to find a snack to tide her over. What she found instead was a grisly scene the gas station clerk lay lifeless on the ground, with several stab wounds marring his body. Panicking, Abigail had rushed back to her car only to find it missing. She frantically searched for help, her fear escalating with every passing second. That was when I found her, trembling on the side of the road. With each word of her story, the sense of dread in the car thickened, and I found myself clenching the wheel even tighter. Suddenly, Abigail let out a blood-curdling shriek, pointing at something in the distance. My eyes darted ahead, only to see another car, identical to mine, approaching at breakneck speed. The car pulled up alongside us, revealing a man in a tattered-down jacket. A sinister grin stretched across his face as he raised his hand, gripping a bloodied knife. My stomach churned with the nauseating realization that this was the murderer Abigail had narrowly escaped. Without warning, the man swerved his car towards us, his malicious intent palpable. Heart pounding, I dodged the oncoming vehicle and slammed on the gas, dodging the deadly attack just in time. The modern-day highwayman relentlessly pursued us, weaving between lanes, his sinister grin never once slipping from his face. As we sped past the gas station where Abigail's ordeal began, my thoughts raced, desperately searching for a way to escape this living nightmare. It was then that I remembered the small revolver I kept in the glove compartment a remnant of a previous life spent in fear. At a red light, I instructed Abigail to retrieve the gun, her trembling hands gripping the cold steel as if her life depended on it. And as it stood, it very well might. As the demented man continued to chase us, I felt the adrenaline push me to newfound limits, my foot pressing harder on the gas pedal. My eyes locked onto his, and I saw the malice drain from his face replaced with an unadulterated terror that mirrored my own. Shoot! I bellowed, swerving the car away from our assailant at the last second. Abigail took one deep breath, closed her eyes, and pulled the trigger. The sound of the gunshot echoed through the night, and I watched as the killer's car veered off the road, crashing into a nearby tree. The impact was violent, and I was certain he wouldn't survive. I brought my car to a screeching halt, my heart pounding wildly in my chest. Abigail stared at the gun, wide-eyed and shaking. Is he, is he dead? She stammered, her voice barely a whisper. I don't know, but we need to call the police, I replied, fumbling for my phone. As I dialed 911, Abigail's eyes remained glued to the wreckage. The operator answered and I quickly relayed our location and the events that had transpired. The police assured us they would be there shortly and instructed us to stay put. Minutes later, 
Flashing red and blue lights illuminated the night as several squad cars arrived at the scene. The officers cautiously approached the mangled vehicle, guns drawn. After a tense moment, they signaled for us to join them. As we drew closer, the twisted metal and shattered glass painted a gruesome picture, but the man inside was nowhere to be found. What? How is that possible? Abigail muttered, her face a mix of confusion and horror. One of the officers, a stern-looking man with salt and pepper hair, turned to us. We'll search the area, but it looks like he managed to escape. We need you to come down to the station to give your statements. As the officer led us to his squad car, I could see the fear return to Abigail's eyes, the relief of her survival now tainted by the knowledge that her attacker was still out there. Back at the station, we recounted our harrowing tale, the officers listening intently. As we finished, one of the detectives spoke up. We've been tracking this guy for weeks. He's known for targeting people at gas stations, usually late at night. We've never had a witness get away before. You're both very lucky. Lucky? Abigail scoffed, her voice trembling. That man is still out there, and he knows what we look like. How are we supposed to feel safe? The detective sighed. We'll do everything we can to find him, but in the meantime... I suggest you both stay vigilant and take precautions. With that, we were sent on our way, the weight of the night's events heavy on our shoulders. As I drove Abigail back to her car, we couldn't help but glance nervously at every passing vehicle, every shadow that danced across the road. As we pulled up to her car, still parked at the gas station, Abigail hesitated. Do you think he's watching us? I couldn't lie to her. It's possible, but you can't live your life in fear. Just be careful, and call me if you need anything. She nodded, her eyes brimming with tears. Thank you? For everything. With that, Abigail climbed into her car and drove away, leaving me alone with my thoughts. The night had taken a dark and terrifying turn, but we had survived. Despite our brush with death, the lingering fear remained. Days turned into weeks, and the police had yet to apprehend the killer. Abigail and I kept in touch, our shared experience bonding us in a way that nothing else could. But the fear never left us, always lurking in the back of our minds like a malevolent shadow. Then one day, Abigail went missing. Desperate to find her, I retraced our steps from that fateful night, eventually leading me back to the desolate gas station. And there, hidden in the darkness, I found a chilling message scrawled in blood. Found you. The realization hit me like a ton of bricks. The killer had been watching us all along. And now, he had taken Abigail. As I stared at the ominous words, I knew that I was next. And with the killer still at large, the terrifying truth became clear. Our nightmare was far from over. It was a crisp autumn night, the kind that sent shivers down your spine and misty breaths into the air. Miles of highway stretched out before me, the white lines and reflective markers barely visible through the dense fog. I always enjoyed night driving, finding a sense of solitude in the quiet hum of the engine, with only the occasional trucker or weary traveler for company. It was late into the night when the truck stop came into view an oasis in the growing darkness. I pulled in, my tank almost empty, and my stomach growling in protest. I was a freelance writer, hopping from one assignment to another, 
chasing stories and deadlines like a nomad. Road trips had become my means of detachment, my way of finding peace in a world of chaos. As I filled up the car, I noticed a group of strangers huddled under the dim light of the truck stop. There was something odd, almost unnerving about them. One man, tall and lanky, adjusted his hat as he glanced in my direction. Another, older and more haggard, mumbled under his breath while staring off into the distance. They were all so engrossed in their conversation that it was as if I had stumbled upon an intimate moment between old friends, making me feel like an intruder. Intrigued, I approached the group, my curiosity overriding any sense of unease. They glanced at me with thinly veiled suspicion, but I introduced myself with a friendly smile, mentioning that I was a writer, and asked if they had any stories to share. The oldest man, Rutherford, seemed to take this as a challenge and began delving into a tale about a haunted stretch of road near the town of Felton. As the story unfolded, the foggy atmosphere only added to its eerie charm. The haunted road, he said, was home to the ghost of a woman who had been brutally murdered. Her spirit lingered, seeking revenge on those who dared to travel the road at night. Rutherford's voice wavered as he recounted the encounters locals had with the apparition, including a man who swore she had appeared in his rearview mirror, causing him to swerve off the road and nearly die. The group huddled closer, sharing their own experiences and theories about the ghost each story more thrilling than the last. I was captivated, my reporter instincts kicking in, and I scribbled down notes, feverishly. I'd barely noticed the hours slipping by until the gas station's attendant, Jarvis, announced that it was time for closing. We bid each other farewell, and I climbed back into my car, eager to return to the haunted road and experience the legend for myself. Driving through the fog, my heart pounded with trepidation, and my hands trembled on the wheel. I strained my eyes, trying to catch a glimpse of the ghostly figure in the darkness. The fog grew thicker, more oppressive, and I began to question the sanity of my decision when a sudden figure appeared in my headlights, causing me to slam on the brakes. I gasped, my heart stuck in my throat. But when the fog cleared, I recognized the tall stranger from the truck stop. His name was Grayson, and he held out a hand, beckoning me to join him. He explained that he and the others had been joking, trying to scare newcomers to the town. They often met at the truck stop to swap stories and unwind. Embarrassed, I agreed to join them on a moonlit walk up the haunted road, my fear replaced with curiosity. As we walked, Grayson told me more about Felton, a quiet town whose residents found solace in sharing ghost stories, embracing the macabre as their way of connecting. There was something oddly comforting about it, and I began to feel a sense of camaraderie with the group. As we reached the crest of a hill, Grayson turned to me, his expression solemn. I need to tell you the truth, he said, his voice barely a whisper. There is no ghost, but there is a murderer. He recounted the tragic tale of Clara, the woman from the ghost story. She had indeed been killed on this very stretch of road, her body dumped unceremoniously in the woods. The investigation had gone cold, leaving the town in a state of perpetual unease. The ghost story was their way of wrestling control from the killer, making the town's fear manageable. I shivered, the air suddenly colder, more ominous. Grayson's confession weighed heavily on my mind, and I realized that in my quest for a story, I had stumbled upon a terrible secret. We continued walking, but the atmosphere had turned hostile, our laughter dying in our throats as we confronted the true darkness that lay beneath the sleepy town's facade. The fog began to dissipate revealing the dimly lit town in the distance. I glanced at the group, my newfound friends bound together by grief and fear, and felt a pang of sorrow for their loss. 
As we walked back to my car, I vowed to help them find the truth, determined to bring Clara's killer to justice. But as I set off down the haunted road, a shadow in the rearview mirror caught my attention. And in that fleeting moment, I couldn't help but wonder if the ghost of Clara had finally found her way home. I never thought my fascination with old maps would land me in a situation like this. As an amateur cartographer, I've always been drawn to the mysteries of the open road, especially the forgotten ones deep within America's heartland. That night, as the cold wind blew against the windshield of my old Chevy, it felt like I was driving into the abyss. Little did I know, that dark, twisted road was leading me into a nightmare I wouldn't soon forget. Griffithville, a once thriving town in rural Arkansas, was my destination. I never would have heard of this place if it weren't for a dusty old map I stumbled upon in the back of a flea market. At first glance, it seemed ordinary, but as I studied it closer, there was something about Griffithville that intrigued me. It wasn't just the name that sent chills up my spine, but also the peculiar road leading in and out of it. The Devil's Bend. I just had to know what secrets it held. That evening, as the sun dipped below the horizon, I reached the infamous bend. Turning off my GPS, I relied on the glow of my headlights to guide me through the darkness. With each passing mile, an eerie sense of dread slowly crept up my spine. Suddenly, a woman emerged from the shadows, frantically waving her arms as if to flag me down. Her desperate eyes met mine, and I knew I had to stop. As I rolled down my window, she stuttered, Thank God you found me. I... I need help. What happened? I asked cautiously my fingers tightening around the steering wheel. She looked around nervously before finally divulging her story. I'm Annabeth Rutledge, she began, swallowing hard. My husband, Charles, worked at the old Griffithville factory. He, he went missing a few weeks ago. The police gave up on the search, but I knew he had to be out here somewhere. I've been looking for him every night since. She shivered violently, her breath forming a cloud of fog in the chilly night air. Glancing over at my passenger seat, I hesitated for a moment before reluctantly inviting her in. As we drove on, Annabeth explained how everyone seemed to have forgotten about Griffithville once the factory closed down, leaving it vulnerable to the darkness that engulfed it. The ghostly outlines of abandoned houses lined the road their windows devoid of light or life. The oppressive silence was only broken by the echoes of our own breathing and the distant howl of the wind. I could feel this place gnawing at my sanity, consuming it bit by bit. The factory's not far from here, Annabeth whispered. That's where I think he might be. As we approached the dilapidated structure, my headlights illuminated a grotesque sight. A mangled deer carcass lay in our path. It was fresh, its blood still pooling in the gravel beneath it. What the hell happened here? I asked, my voice trembling with fear. I don't know, Annabeth stammered, her eyes widening with terror. But we need to turn back. It was too late. As I tried to reverse, the engine sputtered and died. Frantically, I turned the key, but it was no use. We were trapped. A sudden noise from the darkness snapped our attention back to the road. Emerging from the shadows were several hulking figures, their features obscured by the gloom. The largest of them held a bloody knife, his eyes locked with mine. I knew then that this wasn't just a story, 
It was a living nightmare. An iron grip seized my arm, and I heard Annabeth scream. We need to run! We sprinted toward the old factory, the sound of heavy footsteps thundering behind us. Once inside, we hid among the rotting machinery, our hearts pounding in our chests. I looked over at Annabeth and saw the tears streaming down her cheeks. I'm so sorry, she whispered, her voice cracking under the weight of her guilt. I never meant for this to happen. I just wanted to find Charles. As the heavy footsteps neared, I thought back to that old map and the twisted road that had led me here. It was then that I noticed something scratched onto the factory wall, barely visible in the dim moonlight. Annabeth Rutledge, may she rest in peace. The color drained from my face as I realized the horrifying truth. The woman beside me was just as much a ghost as the town that had claimed her. The murderous cult that had taken her husband was still very much alive, and I had been lured right into their trap. With a sudden surge of adrenaline, I grabbed Annabeth's hand and led her through the darkness, praying we'd find a way out. As we stumbled forward, I knew one thing for certain. The road ahead was uncertain, but looking back was no longer an option. We made our way through the labyrinth of decrepit machinery, the darkness closing in on us like a suffocating shroud. The footsteps grew louder and I could hear the muffled voices of our pursuers echoing through the abandoned factory. My heart raced, and my breath came in ragged gasps as we frantically searched for an exit. As we rounded a corner, we stumbled upon a hidden room, the door barely hanging from its hinges. Inside were rows of old, rusted cages, and in one of them lay the lifeless body of Charles Rutledge. Annabeth's heart-wrenching sobs pierced the silence, but we had no time to grieve. Our only hope was to find a way out before the cultists found us. We continued deeper into the factory, the shadows creeping along the walls as if they were alive. In the distance, I spotted a glimmer of light, a small, grimy window that seemed to offer a chance of escape. The window was high up but with the help of some discarded crates, we managed to reach it. As we struggled to force it open, the footsteps grew closer, and the air seemed to grow colder. Finally, the window gave way, and we scrambled out into the moonlit night. As we fled from the factory grounds, a chilling realization hit me. This place was never meant to be found. It was a trap designed to lure in unsuspecting victims like us. I couldn't shake the feeling that we were being watched, that the cultists were waiting for us to make a wrong move. We stumbled upon an old, overgrown path that seemed to lead away from the factory. As we followed it, our terror only grew. The once abandoned houses that lined the road now seemed to be occupied, their windows filled with flickering candlelight and sinister silhouettes. It seemed as if the entire town had awoken from its slumber, drawn out by our presence. Despite our best efforts to stay hidden, we were soon spotted by the townspeople. They emerged from their homes like a swarm of locusts, their faces twisted into grotesque masks of hatred and malice. Annabeth and I ran, our legs burning with exhaustion as we sprinted through the maze of dark streets. Our flight brought us to the edge of a cliff overlooking a raging river, with no other path in sight. We could hear the approaching mob, their bloodthirsty cries filling the air. Annabeth turned to me, her eyes filled with desperation and fear. We have no choice, she said, her voice barely audible over the roar of the water below. We have to jump. With a final glance back at the advancing horde, we took each other's hands and leaped into the abyss. As we plunged into the icy river, the world above seemed to fade away, replaced by the suffocating darkness of the water. The current pulled us under, dragging us further and further from the nightmare we had left behind. As we broke the surface, gasping for air, 
I looked around for any sign of Annabeth. To my horror, she was nowhere to be found. The realization hit me like a tidal wave. She had never truly been there. The ghost of Annabeth Rutledge had guided me through Griffithville, trying to save me from the fate that had befallen her and her husband. And now, her spirit had finally been set free. I managed to swim to the nearest shore, my body shaking from exhaustion and terror. As I stumbled away from the cursed town, I knew that I would never be the same. The events that had transpired would be forever etched into my memory, a haunting reminder of the darkness that lingers in the forgotten corners of the world. And so, my tale ends here, a cautionary story of a long-lost town and the horrors that dwell within. Let it serve as a warning to those who dare to wander off the beaten path, for sometimes, the shadows hold secrets best left undiscovered. I hadn't driven that old country road since my grandfather's funeral. The imposing darkness, punctuated only by the soft glow of the moon, seemed to follow me like a shroud as I navigated the curve of every corner. It was only a few days ago that I read a headline about the serial killer who was still roaming free somewhere in the rural town of Holden, Missouri. My friends called him the Night Driver. The thought alone sent shivers down my spine. Anxiety clawed its way to my chest as I struggled to recall the reason I was on this godforsaken road. It was an urgent text from an old friend, Craig Thompson, that had pulled me from my cozy apartment back to my hometown. He mentioned something about my grandfather's property and an urgent matter to discuss. Craig had been working with local law enforcement on some missing person cases so I figured it was rather important to heed his call. My hands gripped the steering wheel tighter as my headlights flashed across an old, rickety sign. Holden, it read. My stomach churned at the thought of not remembering this place fondly. This town had been the backdrop of many nightmares, some real, some imagined. As I continued to drive, I passed by the old Thompson house, a charming two-story Victorian that had grown dilapidated over the years. There, in the dim light from the porch, I saw Mrs. Thompson, Craig's mother. Her pale face, etched with lines of concern, peered out the window. Her gaze seemed to pierce the darkness, and suddenly, she looked straight at me. I hesitated, wondering if I should stop, but I pressed on. Finally, I reached my destination, the old farmhouse that once belonged to my grandfather. There were no lights on, save for the dim glow of a flashlight at the back door. I could see Craig waiting for me there. Harper, thank God you came, Craig called out as I approached. What's so urgent that I had to come here in the middle of the night? I asked, trying to sound casual even though my heart was pounding. There's some things you need to see, he said, his voice low and serious. He led me inside, where the darkness was almost suffocating. He flicked on the flashlight, and we descended into the basement. My grandfather had been a collector of strange things, from ancient artifacts to peculiar taxidermy. The basement was lined with shelves upon which sat countless jars filled with what appeared to be relics of a bygone era. It was in this macabre setting that we found what we were looking for, a dusty wooden chest. Craig slowly opened the chest, revealing several stacks of faded paper. He handed me a few, and as I began to leaf through them, I felt a cold chill creep up my spine. These are police reports. I stammered, my voice barely a whisper. Missing person cases from the last fifty years, all here in Holden. 
Craig nodded solemnly. The night driver has been active for decades, Harper. Your grandfather, he knew. He was trying to find the killer himself. All the victims disappeared while driving at night, never to be seen again. And all their cars, they were left abandoned on this very road. My heart raced at the implications. You don't think. Grandpa could have been. No, not your grandfather, Craig interrupted. But he did leave us a clue. Look at this, he said, holding up another piece of paper. It was a handwritten list of names, with one crossed out, Douglas Miller. Douglas Miller? I asked, confused. He was a local mechanic. My dad's best friend, actually. He disappeared five years ago, right after his garage burned down. It was ruled an accident, but I found this, he said, pointing at the crossed out name. Your grandfather knew. He suspected Douglas was the night driver, and he's been missing ever since. But you've been investigating the cases. You've been to the crime scenes. Why drag me into this? I asked. Craig hesitated, then swallowed hard. Because, Harper, there's something else. There's a pattern to the victims. They all had a connection. I frowned, awaiting his explanation. They were all related to you. For a moment, the air seemed to freeze, and time stopped. Shock and horror washed over me. That's impossible, I whispered. It's true. Your grandfather left us a clue, and I think he was trying to tell us that Douglas is still out there. He's still hunting your family, Harper. My entire body shook, and it felt like the air had been sucked out of the room. What kind of monstrous revelation was this? Suddenly, a car pulled up outside, its headlights streaking across the basement window. Craig quickly extinguished the flashlight plunging the room into darkness once more. Stay here, he whispered, and carefully made his way upstairs. I remained in the cold, dark basement, clutching the papers as my heart threatened to burst out of my chest. The sound of the car door slamming shut echoed through the night, followed by muffled voices. I strained my ears, trying to make out the conversation. Craig, a gruff, familiar voice said, I didn't expect to see you here. Dad? Craig replied, his voice tense. You've been gone for years. Why are you back? The reply sent a chill down my spine. Because, son, the gruff voice said, the night driver has returned, and there's more to this story than you know. Harper's grandfather, he wasn't trying to find the killer. He was trying to protect me. Now I could barely breathe, the weight of this revelation crushing me. My grandfather had been protecting the night driver? My family's tormentor? It couldn't be true. He was my friend. Craig's father continued. We both knew what Douglas was doing, but he had something over us. Something we couldn't escape. Your grandfather made a deal with him to keep our families safe. In exchange, we'd cover up his crimes. I felt sick. The missing person cases, the abandoned cars, the connections to my family, all of it had been a twisted game of cat and mouse, with my grandfather as an unwilling accomplice. But why tell me this now? Craig demanded. Why come back? Because I've found a way to stop Douglas once and for all, his father replied. But I need your help and Harper's. I couldn't stay hidden any longer. I emerged from the basement, my voice shaking. What do you need us to do? Craig's father looked at me with a mixture of pity and determination. There's a ritual, he explained. One that can bind a person's spirit preventing them from doing harm. Your grandfather discovered it, but he never had the chance to use it. 
He left the instructions in the chest, hidden among the police reports. My hands trembled as I searched through the papers until I found the ritual. It was written in my grandfather's familiar scrawl, a last-ditch effort to save his family from the night driver's wrath. We need to perform the ritual tonight, Craig's father said urgently. It's the only chance we have to stop Douglas before he takes another victim. We followed him to a clearing in the woods, where he had prepared the ritual site. The air was thick with tension and the scent of burning sage. As we began the ritual, I couldn't help but feel an eerie sense of being watched. The darkness around us seemed to close in, suffocating and oppressive. As we spoke the incantations, a sudden gust of wind whipped through the clearing, extinguishing the candles we'd arranged in a circle. A sense of dread settled over me, and I knew in that moment that we were not alone. The night driver had found us. Douglas stepped out from the shadows, his eyes cold and lifeless. You thought you could stop me? He taunted, a sick grin spreading across his face. You thought you could protect your families? You're all fools. Craig's father lunged at him, but Douglas was too quick, dodging the attack and grabbing me. I screamed as he dragged me towards his car, his grip like iron around my arm. You'll be my last, Harper, he hissed. A fitting end to this little game. As he forced me into the car, I felt a surge of adrenaline. I couldn't let this monster win. I couldn't let him take another life. In a desperate move, I grabbed the sage from the ritual site and thrust it into the car's gas tank, praying my plan would work. Douglas didn't notice, his eyes locked on Craig and his father as they tried to intervene. As he turned the key in the ignition, I braced myself for the worst. The car exploded in a burst of flames, the fire consuming both Douglas and me. As the world faded to black, I knew that the night driver's reign of terror was finally over. But the price of our victory was steep. I had paid with my life, and my family would forever be haunted by the knowledge that our own blood had been complicit in the night driver's monstrous deeds. The truth had been revealed, but at what cost? As the flames licked at my body, I couldn't help but wonder if there would ever be peace for the victims of the night driver or if their souls would forever be trapped in the twisted web of deceit and betrayal that had ensnared us all. The night was darker than usual, as if the stars themselves had conspired to obscure the moon. The chilling autumn wind whistled through the trees as I gripped the steering wheel tighter. I always dreaded driving at night. There's something about the oppressive darkness that heightens your senses, pushing your fear to an almost irrational level. My name is Alex Kershaw and my life took an unexpected turn during one seemingly ordinary drive. Living in a small town in Indiana meant that driving for long stretches was a requirement. As a freelance journalist, I often covered stories in neighboring towns and cities, spreading my name and my work across county lines. It was on one such drive that I found myself on a desolate road, navigating through a dense forest. The only source of light was the dim, yellow glow of my headlights, barely puncturing the vast blanket of darkness. Man, it's getting colder by the second. I muttered to myself as I rubbed my hands together, trying to restore circulation to my numb fingers. Craving some human interaction, I reached for my phone and dialed my best friend, Lila Donovan. As the phone rang, I couldn't help but feel a pang of guilt for disturbing her at such a late hour. Alex? What's up? 
It's almost midnight, Lila answered groggily. Hey, Lee, sorry to wake you. Just thought I'd check in with someone before I lose my mind on this creepy night drive. Lila laughed. I swear you're such a baby. You'll be fine. Just enjoy the silence and the darkness. As we continued talking, I spotted a glint of light up ahead, as if someone was waving a flashlight. Drawing closer, I could make out the silhouette of a man, standing by his broken-down car, clearly in need of assistance. Lila, I see someone who needs help. I'm going to pull over and see what's going on. Alex, please be careful. You know how I feel about strangers, she replied, concern lacing her voice. I will, I promise. I'll call you back after. As I parked my car behind the strangers, I grabbed my flashlight and cautiously stepped out. The man, who'd introduced himself as Marcus Whitmore, explained that his car had broken down and that his phone was dead. Could you please give me a ride to a nearby gas station? I know there's one about ten miles from here, Marcus pleaded. Sure, Marcus. Hop in, I replied, not noticing the hint of malice behind his grateful smile. As we drove, Marcus shared tidbits of his life, including his job at a local lumber mill and his recent divorce. His stories were intriguing and his demeanor was disarmingly warm. I couldn't help but feel at ease. However, as we approached a desolate stretch, I noticed Marcus gripping the door handle a bit too tight, his knuckles turning white. It was then that I felt a pang of anxiety creeping up my spine. Hey Alex, can we make a quick stop on this side road? I think I can find some signal to call my sister, Marcus suggested. Alarm bells rang louder in my head, but trying to maintain an air of calm, I nodded and turned onto the barely visible path. As the car came to a stop, Marcus stepped out, phone in hand, pretending to make a call. I seized the opportunity to call Lila, but there was no answer. The nerves intensified as I weighed my options, and I began to wonder if I was being needlessly paranoid. I tried to shake off the creeping sense of dread that enveloped me. Suddenly, Marcus's voice pierced through the silence. Hey, Alex, I think there's someone following us. You should come and take a look. I hesitated. My instincts screamed that something was amiss. Still, the gnawing curiosity propelled me to step out of the car and follow Marcus into the darkness. As we ventured deeper into the woods, I felt as if I was being led further into a trap. The atmosphere grew colder, and the forest seemed to close in around us. I don't see anything, Marcus. Let's head back, I urged, trembling. It was then that he revealed his true intentions. With a sinister grin, Marcus lunged at me, pinning me to the ground with ease. I could see the malevolent glint in his eyes as he whispered. You shouldn't have come out here, Alex. Adrenaline surged through me, and I managed to wrestle free from Marcus's grasp, sprinting back towards the car. The darkness swallowed him just as it had my lingering hope. As I fumbled for my keys, the sound of footsteps echoed behind me. In the nick of time, I unlocked the door and launched myself into the car. As I slammed the accelerator, I glimpsed Marcus emerging from the shadows, hands outstretched in a futile reach. My heart raced, and tears streamed down my cheeks as the car tore through the night, speeding away from the nightmare that had unfolded. I called the police and informed them of the events, praying for someone to make sense of it all. It was only when the police searched the area that they discovered the true depth of Marcus's deception. They found the remains of several individuals, all of whom had been reported missing over the past few months. When I learned this, my blood ran cold, realizing just how close I had come to sharing their fate. 
The chilling memory of that night still haunts me. Yet, the incident had also imprinted a valuable lesson upon me. The line between trust and survival can be painfully thin. As for Marcus, he disappeared without a trace, leaving only a winding path of fear and unanswered questions in his wake. That night, I lay in bed, unable to sleep, the horrifying events replaying in my mind. I knew Marcus was still out there, and I couldn't help but think that maybe he was watching me, waiting for the perfect moment to strike again. My hands trembled, and I struggled to breathe as the anxiety clawed at my chest. A week later, I received an unexpected package. It was a small box, wrapped in plain brown paper, and it had no return address. My heart raced as I opened it, preparing myself for the worst. Inside was a single, crumpled note. The message was brief, but it sent chills down my spine. See you soon, Alex. I immediately contacted the police, who took the note as evidence, but they couldn't guarantee my safety. They advised me to be cautious and to alert them if anything else suspicious occurred. The days that followed were filled with paranoia and fear. I couldn't shake the feeling that Marcus was watching me, waiting to make his move. Then, one night, I received a call from an unknown number. Reluctantly, I picked up the phone, my heart pounding in my ears. Hello? The voice on the other end was distorted, but unmistakably familiar. Marcus. I told you I'd see you soon, Alex. He hissed, his tone menacing. What do you want from me? I demanded, my voice trembling. I want you to understand what it feels like to be hunted to feel the terror that my victims felt. You escaped once, but I promise that won't happen again. The line went dead, leaving me in a cold sweat. For weeks, I lived in a state of constant fear, always looking over my shoulder, never feeling safe. I was a prisoner in my own home, too afraid to venture out into the world. The police continued their search for Marcus, but he remained elusive. One stormy night, as I lay in bed, I heard the sound of breaking glass. My heart leapt into my throat as I realized that Marcus had finally made his move. I scrambled to my feet and grabbed a baseball bat, my only weapon against the monster that stalked me. As I crept through the house, I could hear the faint sound of footsteps, barely audible over the pounding rain. I knew that Marcus was close and that I had to act fast. I found him in the kitchen, his back turned to me, a sinister smile on his face. With a roar, I charged at him, swinging the bat with all my strength. It connected with a sickening crack, and Marcus crumpled to the floor, unconscious. The police arrived shortly after, finally apprehending the man who had terrorized me for so long. As they led Marcus away in handcuffs, I couldn't help but feel a sick sense of satisfaction. I had survived the nightmare, but more than that, I had fought back. As I cruised down the seemingly endless stretch of Route 6, my mind wandered to the events of my earlier conversation. Nothing had quite been the same since returning from deployment overseas, and I had become increasingly distant from friends and family. The one person I stayed close to was Jenna, my sister. She was the only person who understood me, who knew the real me. Jenna was the reason I was driving across the country to see her, desperate for that connection once more. I glanced at my phone, the soft glow illuminating my car's interior. It was 3.17 a.m., and I was somewhere in the desolate heart of Utah. 
Surrounding me was nothing but darkness, with the sole exception of my headlights cutting through the void. I'd never driven this far out into the wilderness before, but Jenna insisted that the drive would be therapeutic. Little did she know, the isolation of the road began to gnaw at my sanity. My thoughts were interrupted by a sudden blinding light in my rearview mirror. It was another car, approaching at high speed. I squinted as I tried to make out any details, but the light was too intense. Moments later, the car sped past me, and I finally caught a glimpse of the driver. He was a middle-aged man with a beard, a blank expression on his face. The car had out-of-state plates, ending in 78Y. What the hell was he doing out here in the middle of the night? I shook it off and continued driving the darkness swallowing the other car's taillights. Then, almost as if in response, my phone buzzed. My heart skipped a beat as I reached for it, hoping it was Jenna, but instead, it was a text from an unknown number. Driving alone at night can be dangerous. It read. My heart began to race. Who could it be? Was it the man in the other car? I tried to reassure myself that it was just a coincidence. Perhaps Jenna had mentioned my trip to someone. But something in the pit of my stomach told me otherwise. Not a minute later, the same blinding light appeared in my rearview mirror. The car was back, and this time, it followed me closely, its headlights casting eerie shadows on the road. I gripped the wheel, my knuckles turning white and floored the accelerator. The engine roared as the speedometer climbed, but still, the other car remained on my tail. Suddenly, the car overtook me once more, this time swerving dangerously close. I had no choice but to grind to a halt, skidding to the side of the road. The other car parked a short distance ahead, its engine still running. My heart pounded in my chest as I saw the driver get out a menacing silhouette against the night. I began to reach for my phone, intending to call the police, only to find it dead. Panic set in as I searched for somewhere to escape. I spotted a small road leading off into the woods, barely visible and unmarked. It was now or never. I put my car in gear and darted towards the hidden road, kicking up gravel as I went. The other car's headlights reflected in my mirrors as it pursued me along the winding path. The chase went on for what felt like hours, through dense forests and across rickety bridges. Finally, my car's engine began to sputter and cough, and I knew that I was nearly out of gas. I saw headlights approaching from the opposite direction and, in desperation, I decided to flag them down. As the car came closer, I saw it was a police cruiser. Relief washed over me as I explained my situation to the officer, a stern-looking woman named Officer Maddox. She radioed for backup and instructed me to wait in her cruiser. As we sat in the brightly lit squad car, we saw the headlights of my pursuer approaching us. I braced myself, ready for the inevitable confrontation. The other car slowed to a halt, and the driver stepped out, hands raised. To my shock, it wasn't the man I had seen earlier. It was a woman, her eyes wild with fear. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to scare you, she stammered. My name is Emily, and I saw that man in the car ahead of you. I've been following him for days. He, he murdered my husband. I didn't know what else to do. Officer Maddox and the backup officers arrested both Emily and the man, who was found hiding in the woods nearby. His name was Stanley Peterson, a known serial killer who had been on the run for years. They discovered I wasn't his first target that night, but his second, the first was an unfortunate driver with a similar car, also traveling Route 6. As I looked at Stanley, his blank eyes staring back at me, a shiver ran down my spine. 
I couldn't shake the feeling that fate had placed me on that road, as if I was meant to unravel this twisted mystery. The following morning, as the sun rose over the Utah desert, I resumed my journey to Jenna. My life would never be the same after that night, but I knew I had a story to tell, a story of darkness, danger, and the unbreakable bond between siblings. Rain pelted the windshield like a million tiny hammers in relentless pursuit of shattering glass. I couldn't help but feel that each droplet was trying to infiltrate my old rickety Honda Civic, an obscure relic of the late 90s. I had always felt a certain attachment to my car, as though it was a creature destined to traverse the treacherous roads with me, and me alone. My name is Avery Jackson a freelance copywriter and digital marketer who had been living in Chicago for the past six years. The city was beautiful, but the oppressive nature of its skyscrapers left me feeling trapped, like a fox caught in a cage. I had decided to embark on a road trip to the Pacific Northwest, determined to disconnect from the hustle and bustle of city life for a brief respite. The rain poured harder as I found myself driving through the dense forests of Oregon. The ancient trees provided a surreal backdrop to the long stretch of asphalt that lay ahead. My muscles tensed at the thought of the stories that had unfolded between the tangled branches and hidden hollows amidst the darkness. I spotted a figure on the side of the road, drenched and shivering. Instinctively, my foot touched the brake halting my car just inches away from the ghostly apparition. Rolling down the window, the rain splattered across my face, a mix of cold and warm, like icy nails upon flesh. Hey there, I called out. You need a ride? The figure, a woman with auburn hair and sorrowful eyes, nodded, seemingly unsure. She clutched a duffel bag with a white-knuckled grip. I'm... My name is Emily MacArthur. My car broke down a few miles back, and my phone is dead. I could really use some help. I hesitated for a moment. In this day and age, kindness was a currency often misused. But the sincerity in her voice and the vulnerability in her eyes convinced me to open the door for her. As Emily stepped in, Wrapping herself in the warmth of my car's heating system, I couldn't help but feel that I had made the right choice. She expressed her gratitude, her voice a mixture of relief and exhaustion. Losing my sense of caution, I decided to inquire more about her story. Emily revealed that she was an elementary school teacher in Portland, heading back to her hometown to attend her sister's wedding. Her car, a beat-up 2003 Chevy Impala, had given up on her in those unforgiving woods, leaving her stranded and desperate. Before long, our conversation veered into darker territory as we shared stories of the macabre, the twisted tales of our childhoods that left our imaginations running wild. The rain failed to subside as the forest shadows grew longer, the winding road seemingly endless. Suddenly, Emily's eyes widened, and her voice grew hushed. Do you know the story of the Oregon Moonlight Murderer? I shook my head, curious about where this conversation was headed. In the late 80s, there was a series of gruesome murders that shook our little community. They called him the Moonlight Murderer cause he only struck on nights like this, when the moon was obscured by clouds. As Emily recounted the chilling story, I felt a shiver run down my spine. The Moonlight Murderer was renowned for his brutal methods, 
carving intricate patterns upon his victim's flesh before discarding their bodies in the forest. The killer had never been caught, and his legend had turned into something of an urban myth, a story whispered by locals to keep children from wandering into the woods after dark. Emily's voice grew quiet as she recalled a childhood friend named Simon Carter, the youngest victim of the Moonlight Murderer. The sorrow in her words gripped my heart, and I couldn't help but ask, What happened to him? She averted her gaze, the shadows of the trees reflecting off her tear-filled eyes. Simon was a good kid, but he was in the wrong place at the wrong time. The murderer took him and left his body in shreds. The entire town was devastated. The rain outside had quieted to a soft drizzle and the shadows had faded slightly as the moon began to appear from behind the clouds. We drove in silence for several minutes, both lost in thoughts of the atrocities that had plagued this once tranquil community. Before long, the rain ceased entirely, revealing a moonlit night that filled the forest with an eerie luminescence. I could feel the weight of the stories bearing down upon us, their ghosts lingering within the trees. As the headlights of my car pierced the darkness, a sense of foreboding enveloped me. That's when I saw it, the glint of metal off the side of the road. It was a car, eerily familiar and unmistakably abandoned. My breath caught in my throat as I realized it was a beat-up 2003 Chevy Impala, its doors agape as though begging for salvation. Emily's grip on her duffel bag tightened and her gaze pierced me like a sharpened knife. Her voice, now cold and emotionless, sent shivers down my spine. You know, some say the moonlight murderer is still out there, waiting for the perfect night to strike again. As the moonlight illuminated her once sorrowful eyes, a gleam of malice and madness took hold. My heart raced as I realized the car that had given up on her in the forest had just been a pawn in her twisted game. And as the blade of the knife glinted in the moonlight, I knew that the moonlight murderer had returned, and I was at the mercy of her sinister desires. As a child, I always knew to avoid driving at night. My mother would tell me tales of sinister things lurking within the shadows, waiting for their next victim. Nevertheless, as an adult, circumstances made it impossible to avoid the cover of darkness. My life as a freelance writer demanded constant travel in the pursuit of stories, and my small hometown in the backwoods of Montana had become too confining. Just last year, I was heading towards Rockford, Illinois, in search of a potential lead on a story. With the sun long gone and the moon casting a ghostly glow over the landscape, an uneasy feeling crept over me. The stretch of abandoned freeway before me seemed to lead into the abyss. Suddenly, I heard the distant creaking of metal. In my rearview mirror, I caught a glimpse of a decommissioned school bus its gaudy chartreuse hue barely visible in the dim light. It was stationary, but the image reminded me of my childhood fears. I shook off the uneasy feeling, trying to remain focused on the road ahead. As I continued driving, I began to notice peculiar patterns on the road, all too familiar. It appeared someone had been driving in circles. Then, a copse of trees came into view off the side of the highway. I strained my eyes to discern the pale form of what appeared to be a woman near the tree lean. I hesitated for a moment, pondering whether to stop and assist her. In the end, my journalistic curiosity and innate sense of duty won over. I pulled over and cautiously stepped out of my car, calling out to the figure, Hey! 
Are you all right? It's not safe out here in the dark. She turned slowly, revealing a face streaked with dirt and streaks of dried blood. Please help me, she whispered. Her name was Amanda Kingsley, and she recounted a story of escaping a murderous madman who had kidnapped her and two others named Michael Shaw and Sarah Whitman. They had been held captive in a nearby cabin, and Michael and Sarah were still inside, held by the one who called himself the night driver. The gravity of the situation hit me like a ton of bricks. This story was more than I had bargained for. My journalistic instincts roared to life, and amidst the fear and uncertainty, my mind raced with questions. Was this really happening? And more importantly, what should I do next? Together, Amanda and I concocted a daring plan. We would sneak back to the cabin, subdue the captor, free Michael and Sarah, and bring the night driver to justice. Simple enough, right? The closer we got to the cabin, the faint sound of a car engine murmured in the distance. The night driver was making his way back. Tense, we hid behind a large oak tree, waiting for the approaching vehicle. Through the darkness, a rusty, battered truck pulled alongside the cabin, and out stepped a man, his face obscured by shadows. He opened the front door, and for the first time, Amanda caught a glimpse of the man who had imprisoned her for weeks. He was known around town as Chuck, a seemingly harmless mechanic with a charming smile. No one had suspected him of such heinous crimes. Amanda shuddered, grabbing my arm tightly. That's him. It's Chuck. We have to act fast. We waited as Chuck entered the cabin, then cautiously made our way towards the entrance. Following Amanda's lead, we crept inside, our hearts pounding in unison. I could almost feel her fear pulsating through my veins. We found Michael and Sarah, bound and gagged, in the back room. Hastily, we freed them, and together, the four of us made our escape. Little did we know, our nightmare was far from over. As we cautiously made our way back to my car, Chuck emerged from the shadows, brandishing a knife. His once charming smile had become a twisted smirk, his eyes filled with an unhinged darkness. He lunged at us, slashing the knife through the air. The four of us scattered, the night driver in hot pursuit. Our breaths came in short, shallow gasps as we dodged his frenzied attacks, fear fueling our desperate attempts to survive. As we ran for our lives, Amanda suddenly cried out. In that instant, I understood that she was not who she seemed. In a whirlwind of the truth, I realized that Amanda Kingsley was none other than Sarah Whitman. The real Amanda had died at the hands of her captor. The fear I had felt in her grip now turned to terror. Betrayed, I could only watch as the real Sarah Whitman, the twisted mastermind behind our torment, turned on her accomplice, Chuck. Together, they closed in on me, their laughter echoing through the night like a banshee's wail. My instincts screamed for me to run, but I knew I couldn't outrun my fate. My journalistic career, my once insatiable curiosity, had led me to the darkest, deadliest story of my life. In that moment, as the darkness closed around me, I understood the true terror of driving at night, the inescapable, suffocating fear that consumes you whole. In the midst of my desperation, I stumbled upon a rusted crowbar lying on the ground, left behind by the very monsters hunting me. Seizing the opportunity, I picked it up, my heart pounding in my chest. I knew this was my last chance to survive. Chuck charged at me, his knife glinting menacingly in the moonlight. But instead of succumbing to fear, I swung the crowbar with all my might, striking him in the temple. He crumpled to the ground, unconscious, but I couldn't afford to waste any time. Sarah Whitman, the twisted mastermind, was still coming for me. 
I sprinted through the dark woods, my lungs burning, my legs feeling like they would give out at any moment. The sinister laughter of Sarah Whitman echoed behind me, a harrowing reminder of the betrayal I had experienced. I knew I had to make it to my car before she caught up to me. It was my only chance of escape. As I finally reached my car, my fingers fumbled with the keys, adrenaline coursing through my veins. I could hear Sarah's footsteps getting closer, her laughter becoming more manic by the second. Just as I managed to unlock the door and begin to climb inside, she lunged at me, her hands clawing at my arm. I kicked her away with all the strength I could muster, slamming the car door shut and jamming the keys into the ignition. The engine roared to life, and I floored the accelerator, leaving Sarah Whitman and the unconscious Chuck behind. As I sped down the desolate road, my head spinning with the horrors I had just endured, I couldn't shake the feeling that my nightmare was far from over. There was no way Sarah Whitman would give up so easily. Her thirst for vengeance was insatiable. My journalistic instincts told me I had to expose the truth to bring this terrifying story to light. But as I drove into the night, my rearview mirror filled with darkness, I couldn't help but feel a chilling sense of dread. The night driver and his twisted accomplice were still out there, lurking in the shadows, waiting for their next unsuspecting victim. The fear that had once consumed me now transformed into a grim determination. I would not let their reign of terror continue. I knew I had to bring this harrowing tale to the world, to warn others of the darkness that lurked behind seemingly ordinary faces. As my car sped into the night, I knew my life would never be the same again. The story would be told, but at what cost? Would the horrifying truth set me free, or would it condemn me to a lifetime of fear, forever haunted by the twisted figures that stalked the night? Only time would tell. But one thing was for certain, the night was no longer a refuge, but a hunting ground for the shadows that refused to be tamed. And as I drove on, the echo of their laughter still ringing in my ears, I knew that my life was forever intertwined with the darkness, leaving me questioning every shadow, every sound, and every stranger I met. For the night driver and his accomplice were still out there, and their sinister game was far from over. On a moonless night, I found myself behind the wheel of my trusty 1998 Ford Taurus, cruising down an empty stretch of highway in eastern Colorado. The darkness was thick, and the distant flickering of my headlights did little to break the crushing void that surrounded me. My name is Lucas Fitzgerald, an online content writer who had recently delved into the world of podcasting. My latest project? documenting the eerie tales of the desolate roads that crisscrossed rural America. As the gravel crunched beneath my tires, I glanced at the rearview mirror, half expecting to see the glowing eyes of a malevolent apparition. However, all that met my gaze was the endless abyss that I had been driving through for hours. The whiskey-throated voice of James Hanover, my fellow podcaster and researcher, crackled through the speaker. Lucas, I've got a hot lead on a local legend from these parts. If you can hold out for another 30 minutes, we'll be at the right spot to dig deeper into this story. Trust me, this one's worth it. All right, James. I sighed. But this better be good. The minutes ticked by like hours, and it was with growing trepidation that I continued my journey into the night. Eventually, my headlights illuminated a dilapidated road sign, 
signaling that I had reached the turnoff for the ghost town of Cadwell the site of our investigation. I took a deep breath and ventured into the unknown. Cadwell had been abandoned since the 1960s, its residents fleeing in the wake of a brutal series of murders committed by the notorious Cadwell Butcher. As I navigated the crumbling streets, I couldn't help but feel the weight of the town's dark history pressing down on me. It was as if the very air was poisoned by the unspeakable atrocities that had unfolded here. James had arranged for us to meet up with a local named Sarah Winchester, whose grandfather had been a key eyewitness in the murder case. We arranged to meet her at the ruins of the town's old church. As I pulled up to the ruined structure, I saw a ghostly figure standing in the shadows, her pale face illuminated by the soft glow of her phone screen. Lucas? she asked, her voice trembling. Yeah, it's me. James sent me. He'll be here any minute. I replied, trying to sound more confident than I felt. Moments later, James arrived and we got down to business. Sarah recounted the gruesome details of the killings, her voice barely more than a whisper. The victims had been brutally mutilated, their bodies left in gruesome tableaus that spoke to the twisted mind of the murderer. Despite an extensive manhunt, the Cadwell Butcher was never apprehended. Some even speculated that the killer still lurked somewhere in the town's shadowy recesses. As Sarah's tale unfolded, I could feel the tense atmosphere of the story in the very air around us. I suggested that we visit one of the abandoned homes, hoping to capture some EVPs or other evidence of paranormal activity. The house we entered was like a time capsule, frozen in the moment of its inhabitants' flight. Dust-covered dishes lay untouched on the kitchen table, a stark testament to the swiftness with which the town was abandoned. The air was thick with the stench of decay, and the darkness seemed to press in on us from all sides. As we wandered through the rooms, I couldn't shake the feeling that we weren't alone. My heart pounded in my ears my breath coming in short, sharp gasps. We were walking through the lair of a monster, a place tainted by unimaginable horror. Suddenly, Sarah let out a blood-curdling scream. James and I turned to see her, standing ashen-faced in the doorway of a bedroom, her phone's flashlight illuminating the charred remains of a human corpse sprawled across the bed. As we stood in horrified silence, I noticed a scrap of paper wedged in the skeletal hand. I hesitated, then carefully pried the note free. As I read the message, a cold chill ran down my spine. I told you I'd be back, the Cadwell Butcher. The air seemed to grow colder, and I knew that our intrusion had awoken something sinister in the depths of this ghost town. I could feel the presence of evil closing in around us drawn to the macabre display that we had uncovered. We had to get out. Go, go! I yelled, and we hastily retreated from the house, running back to our cars as if pursued by the very specter of death itself. That night, as we sped away from the cursed town of Cadwell, I couldn't help but think of the note in the skeletal hand. We had stumbled onto something far more sinister than a simple ghost story something that had been hidden away in the shadows for decades. The Cadwell Butcher had never been caught. He had merely been waiting for the perfect moment to strike again. And somehow, fate had led us straight into his murderous path. As I drove through the darkness, I couldn't help but shudder at the terror that had unfolded before my eyes. It was a story that would haunt my nightmares for years to come and a chilling reminder that the darkness always lies in wait, ready to claim its next victim.
It was midnight on a pitch black, moonless night in the small town of Ridgewood in West Virginia. The air carried a bitter chill, and a dense fog obscured the road ahead. My heart raced in my chest, each beat echoing the howling wind outside. I knew I shouldn't have taken this detour through the mountains, but it was the quickest way to Father O'Brien's funeral. The old priest had been a mentor to me, like a father I never had, and he deserved a proper final farewell. The winding road seemed to stretch on forever, an endless nightmare of sharp turns and dimly lit stretches. The fog grew thicker, nearly swallowing my headlights. Suddenly up ahead, a figure emerged from the darkness. It looked like a girl, her eyes wide with fear. I slammed on the brakes, my tires screeching on the wet asphalt. Hey, are you okay? I asked as I rolled down my window. Her eyes darted around as she muttered something incoherent. My name is Ethan Harrington, I said, attempting to calm her down. What's your name? Tara, she whispered. Tara Aldridge. What happened? I asked, concern lacing my voice. I... I don't know, she responded, her eyes never leaving the ground. I was driving, and then... There was blood. Everywhere. Visions of a fresh murder scene flooded my mind, and I felt a cold hand grip my heart. Get in the car, Tara, I said firmly. We need to get you to safety. She hesitated, glancing back into the darkness from which she'd emerged. Okay, she agreed, her voice wavering. As we continued down the road, I tried to make sense of Tara's situation, but nothing seemed to add up. She spoke of her cousin, Amelia Barrows, a local photographer who had been in town for a few days. Tara had been driving Amelia's car earlier that night when she discovered the grisly scene. The car is just up there, she said, pointing to a bend in the road where the fog peeled back to reveal a beaten-down silver sedan. I pulled over and stepped out, my instincts screaming for me to turn back. Tara followed closely behind, trembling. The car was a mess. The windshield had been smashed, and the driver's side door was stained with blood. With horror, I realized the blood was splattered across the back seat, and it carried onwards, leading to the trunk. Ethan, Tara choked out, tears streaming down her face. I think, I think Amelia is in the trunk. I hesitated, every fiber of my being warning me against opening it. But I couldn't leave her there, not like this. My hand gripped the trunk latch, and I counted to three. The trunk swung open with a groan, revealing the mangled body of Amelia Barrows. Her eyes were lifeless, her once vibrant red hair now a muted shade of crimson soaked with her own blood. Tara's horrified scream echoed through the night. I reached for my phone to call 911, but the screen remained stubbornly black. The battery was dead. Desperation clawed at my chest, and I knew we had to leave. We ran back to my car, the fog swirling around us like a vengeful spirit. As we sped away, the fog grew even denser and I could barely see the edge of the road. Then, through the mist, a pair of headlights appeared behind us, their high beams blazing. I gripped the wheel tightly, my knuckles white. The car behind us sped up, inching closer and closer. I knew I couldn't outrun them on these treacherous roads, so I slowed down to let them pass. But they didn't. The driver's side window of the car rolled down, revealing a man in a black ski mask. His eyes were cold, dead. I recognized the murder weapon, a large, blood-stained knife, in his hand. My heart hammered in my chest as I slammed on the gas, praying for an escape. Suddenly, the road gave way to a straight stretch, and I pushed the car to its limits. The headlights of our pursuer grew smaller in the rearview mirror, 
and I started to breathe a sigh of relief. But my relief was short-lived. With a flash of lightning, the road split in front of us, revealing a deep ravine. A sinking feeling rose in my chest. There was no way out. I slammed on the brakes, the tires squealing beneath us. The masked man's car appeared once more, pulling up beside us. He stepped out, his knife glinting menacingly in the faint moonlight. I knew we couldn't outrun him, not on foot. Tara grabbed a tire iron from under her seat, her eyes fierce with determination. We can do this, she whispered, her voice shaking. Together. As the masked man approached, I knew she was right. We had no other option. With a deep breath, I opened my car door, my hands balled into fists. It was now or never. We fought with everything we had, the tire iron and our adrenaline giving us the edge we needed. The masked man stumbled backward, disoriented. It was in that moment that I recognized a familiar tattoo on the man's forearm, Father O'Brien's initials, an homage to the priest who had guided him through his darkest hours. With a sickening realization, I understood that the man we just defeated was none other than my childhood best friend, James Donnelly. As his lifeless body fell to the ground, my heart shattered. How could this be? My best friend, the murderer? Everything fell into place. James had been the one terrorizing our small town for months, leaving a trail of death in his wake. It was his anger and bitterness that had festered over the years, a darkness that had consumed him. Now I was the one responsible for ending his life. Tara and I stood there, panting, as the reality of the situation settled in. We had just faced our own worst nightmare, and there was no going back. What do we do now? Tara asked, her voice barely audible. We have to report this. I replied, struggling to keep my emotions in check. We have to make sure no one else gets hurt. As we drove to the police station, the weight of our actions and the loss of my best friend weighed heavily on my heart. I couldn't shake the feeling that there was more to the story, something we were missing. But one thing was certain, our lives would never be the same. At the station, we recounted the horrifying events of the night to the disbelieving officers. They took our statements and began their investigation. As we left the station to return home, a chilling wind blew through the trees, sending shivers down my spine. Over the next few days, the town was abuzz with the shocking revelation of James Donnelly's double life. Friends and neighbors whispered about the once-beloved local hero who had turned into a cold-blooded killer. The media swarmed our small town, clamoring for the gruesome details of the story. But as the days turned into weeks, and the weeks into months, the whispers died down, and a heavy silence settled over the town. The truth was far more terrifying than any ghost story or urban legend. Evil had lived among us, wearing the face of someone we knew and trusted. It was only after the one-year anniversary of James's death that a mysterious letter arrived at my doorstep. The handwriting was shaky, the ink smudged. It was a letter written by Father O'Brien himself, dated just a few days before his sudden passing. In the letter, Father O'Brien confessed to having known about James's dark deeds, and how he had tried to help him find redemption, but ultimately failed. The priest expressed his deep regret for not doing more to save James's soul, and begged for my forgiveness. As I read the letter, my hands trembled, and a cold sweat broke out on my forehead. The horrifying truth was finally revealed. Father O'Brien had been in on it all along, guiding and supporting James in his twisted killing spree. The terror that had gripped our town had not been the work of a single man, but a twisted partnership born from the shadows. As I stood there, the letter clutched in my shaking hands, I couldn't help but wonder, 
How many more secrets were lurking in the darkness, waiting to be discovered? How many more lives would be destroyed by the hidden evils that walked among us? It was a question that would haunt me for the rest of my days, as the ghosts of my past refused to let me forget the night I faced my own best friend in a battle for our very lives. That night, the darkness had won, and our town would never be the same again. I can't shake the gut-wrenching feeling from that night even now, years later as I jot down these memories, trying to make sense of the events that unfolded. It had all started as a seemingly innocuous road trip across the country, a rite of passage for our little group of childhood friends who had just graduated from college. Little did we know the horrors that awaited us on that forsaken stretch of road in southern Louisiana. As the sun began to set, casting fiery hues across the sky, our spirits were high. We were four strong, Jeremy Banks, Courtney Blakely, Sophia Ramirez, and me, Cameron Patel. We had driven nonstop since the morning, and I could feel the weight of exhaustion setting in. But we were determined to carry on through the night, too afraid that if we stopped, our real lives would catch up with us. The fearful thoughts of our upcoming careers, worries about being successful, and the very real possibility of growing apart were silently tucked away in the recesses of our minds. Nightfall had well and truly settled in as we entered a quiet part of Louisiana, where the roads were empty and devoid of streetlights. Headlights were the only source of illumination in that inky darkness. Our jokes and laughter had dwindled down by then, leaving a heavy silence hanging in the air. That's when we saw it, a dim outline in the distance. As we drew closer, it became apparent that it was a car, abandoned, with its driver's side door wide open. A chill ran down my spine as I glanced at Jeremy, who was behind the wheel. He seemed equally disturbed by the sight. Do you guys think we should stop and check it out? Courtney asked, her eyes wide with concern. Jeremy hesitated, his grip on the steering wheel visibly tense. I don't know. What if it's a trap or something? Sophia chimed in, her Spanish accent adding an air of urgency. But what if someone's hurt? We can't just leave them here. Jeremy sighed, pulled over and brought the car to a stop. Fine, but I don't have a good feeling about this. Cameron, you stay here with the girls. I sat in the back seat, watching anxiously as Jeremy warily approached the abandoned vehicle. In the rearview mirror, I could see Courtney and Sophia nervously whispering to each other. The atmosphere was thick with the impending sense of doom. Minutes felt like hours as we waited for Jeremy's return. Finally, he reappeared, his face pale and gaunt. There's no one there, he croaked. But there's a lot of blood on the driver's seat. Courtney gasped, and Sophia crossed herself, uttering a fervent prayer in rapid Spanish. We decided to call the police and wait for them to arrive but our unexpected detour on this desolate road was far from over. As we sat there, headlights appeared in the distance. Our hearts raced, unsure if they belonged to a friend or foe. The approaching car eventually pulled over near the abandoned one, and four strangers climbed out, eyeing us suspiciously. Is everything all right? One of them yelled in a thick southern drawl. He was tall and burly with a grizzled beard and piercing eyes that seemed to see right through us. Jeremy hesitated before stepping out again, hands raised in a non-threatening gesture. We found this car abandoned, and there's blood inside. 
We called the police, and they're on their way. The leader of the strangers, who introduced himself as Grady Thompson, furrowed his brow. Well, we'll wait with y'all. Safety in numbers, right? His voice held a trace of concern that belied his fearsome appearance. As we waited for the police, we got to know our newfound companions, Grady, along with his friends, Wella and Jackson, and Wella's younger sister, Maisie. They were locals, returning from a late-night fishing trip. We traded stories, and for a moment, the tension in the air dissipated. And then there was a blood-curdling scream. Grady and Jeremy bolted towards the source, the abandoned car. To our horror, the lifeless body of a young woman lay in the back seat, her eyes wide open, her face contorted in eternal terror. We hadn't noticed her before. There was no way she had been there when Jeremy first checked the car. As one, the eight of us moved to the far side of the road, clinging together in terror as we witnessed a shadowy figure emerge from the darkness, dragging the limp body of a man. The figure dropped the corpse at its feet, revealing its monstrous, twisted, inhuman features. There was no time to react, no time to think. All that existed was the primal urge to survive, and so we ran. We ran with our hearts pounding in our chests and our lungs burning, knowing that the night had swallowed us whole and there was no escape from the terror that stalked us. We didn't make it far before Grady and Jackson took a stand, their southern grit overcoming their fear. They turned to confront the creature, buying us precious seconds to scramble into our cars and flee the scene. I don't know what happened to Grady and Jackson, but their sacrifice ensured our survival. By some miracle, we made it to the nearest town, where the police took over, their faces a mix of disbelief and horror as we recounted the night's events. As the years have passed, I still wonder if it was all just a nightmarish hallucination, brought on by exhaustion or some unknown toxin. But deep down, in that dark and twisted corner of my soul, I know the truth. We encountered something unnatural that night on that desolate road, something that defied explanation and haunted us for the rest of our lives. The police were baffled by the scene we described, and it wasn't long before rumors began to circulate about what we'd witnessed. Some called it a serial killer, others a pack of wild animals, but none could offer a satisfactory explanation for the gruesome carnage. In the months that followed, locals started sharing their own chilling encounters with the beast they now referred to as the Shadow of Desolation Road. In a futile attempt to put the nightmare behind me, I sought solace in researching the area's dark history. It was then that I stumbled upon an old newspaper article detailing a similar event from over a century ago. It spoke of a group of travelers who'd encountered a terrifying creature on that same stretch of road, leaving behind only blood-soaked earth and a chilling tale of horror. I shared my discovery with the remaining survivors of that fateful night, and we decided to confront the truth together. We returned to the scene of the nightmare, determined to solve the mystery and lay to rest the evil that haunted us. But as we approached the spot where the abandoned car had once stood, we found something we never expected. There, in the middle of the road, was a crude wooden cross surrounded by a circle of scorched earth. At the base of the cross, a single word was etched into the wood. Grady. It was as if the universe was taunting us, reminding us of the friends we'd lost and the horrors we couldn't escape. As we stood there, Dumbfounded, the air around us grew unnaturally still, and we felt a presence lurking in the shadows. A voice, barely audible, whispered in our ears, You shouldn't have come back. Panicked, we fled the scene once more, knowing in our hearts that the evil was still there, waiting to claim more victims. Years have passed since that night, and the weight of the terror we experienced still hangs heavy on our souls. 
I often find myself staring into the darkness, wondering if the shadow of desolation road will come for me, as it did for Grady and Jackson. The unsolved mystery, the unanswered questions, and the chilling memories refuse to leave me. In the end, I have come to accept that some horrors are best left alone, buried in the depths of our nightmares. But every now and then, as I drive alone down a desolate road, I can't help but feel a shiver run down my spine, and I wonder if the shadow of Desolation Road is still out there, watching, waiting, and hungering for its next victim. The headlights pierce through the murky darkness, illuminating a single lonely stretch of road. It was late, and my eyelids felt like they were made of lead. But I had no choice. The deadline was crucial, and I had to deliver those boxes to the warehouse on time. My name is Kevin Winstead, and I'm a private contractor, or a mule, as some folks call us. This job was my lifeline and for the past couple of years, it had been my sole source of income. It wasn't the most glamorous life, but it had always been a reliable one. Until that night. As the miles ticked away, I realized I was running low on gas. That's when I remembered a little offbeat gas station named O'Hara's, a place I had stopped at many times before on this same route. O'Hara's was a family-owned business run by a chatty old couple who had seen better days. Mr. O'Hara had a distinctive limp due to an accident while serving in the military, while Mrs. O'Hara wore an ever-present red scarf around her neck, a family heirloom, she claimed. Their conversations were the only thing that made my stops there bearable. The station materialized out of the darkness like a mirage its lights flickering faintly. I pulled up to the pump and stepped out into the cool night air. O'Hara's was deserted, not entirely surprising given the late hour. I waited for the customary sound of the doorbell chime to signal my approach, but was met with silence. Mr. O'Hara? I called out, cautiously opening the door. Mrs. O'Hara? The air was thick with tension, and I felt a chill crawl up my spine. The lights flickered ominously above me as I walked up to the counter, my every footfall echoing in the silence. That's when I saw it, a pool of crimson seeping across the floor. My heart raced as I traced its source to the body of Mr. O'Hara, sprawled unceremoniously behind the counter. My knees went weak, my head spinning. I stumbled backward and slammed into the door, a primal urge to escape forcing itself to the forefront of my consciousness. No, 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 I muttered, reaching into my pocket for my phone. But fate had other plans. The battery was dead, its last charge long forgotten. I was trapped with no way to call for help, in the middle of nowhere with a lifeless body lying only a few feet away from me. It was then that I noticed something peculiar etched into the blood-stained floor, a message that sent shivers down my spine. You're next. My hands trembled as I frantically scanned the room for any sign of the killer. The overwhelming stench of gasoline made it clear that whoever had murdered Mr. O'Hara intended to leave nothing but smoldering ashes in their wake. I bolted out the door determined to make my escape before they had the chance to strike again. But as I reached my car, I spotted a figure in my rearview mirror, Mrs. O'Hara. Icy terror gripped my heart as I saw the glint of bloody steel in her hand. Mrs. O'Hara, are you all right? I called out, hesitating, unsure if she was the predator or the prey. Her voice trembled as she replied, 
Please, Kevin, you have to help me. They're coming for me next. I hesitated for a moment, but ultimately relented. How could I leave the old woman to suffer the same gruesome fate as her husband? But as I helped her into my car, I couldn't help but wonder, why had the killer spared her? What kind of twisted game were they playing? We sped off into the night, our hearts pounding in sync with the engine's roar. Despite our desperate situation, we tried to piece together the events that had unfolded, hoping to unravel the mystery that now bound our lives together. Mrs. O'Hara mentioned a stranger who had visited the station a few hours earlier, a man named Hank Rowley who had been asking questions about me. As I listened to her speak, I realized with a sickening sense of dread that the man she was describing was my competition, another private contractor who had been trying to muscle in on my territory. The chilling realization was like a punch to the gut. The man was out to eliminate me, and he had set his sights on the O'Hara's to send a blood-soaked message. We frantically searched for a police station, but our efforts were in vain. The backroads of rural America were unforgiving to those unfamiliar with their winding paths. With each passing moment, we could feel the threat of Hank Rowley's blade drawing closer. Our time was running out. Just when I was about to surrender to the despair, I caught a glimpse of salvation, a sign for a sheriff's station just a few miles away. Relief washed over me, though it was short-lived. As we pulled into the parking lot, we found the doors locked and the station empty. Determined to save Mrs. O'Hara, I led her along the desolate streets, each step taking us further into an abyss of uncertainty. As we stumbled through the pitch-black night, I could feel Hank's presence creeping closer, his blade just waiting for the right moment to strike. Suddenly, Mrs. O'Hara's grip on my arm tightened, and she whispered hoarsely, He's here. A chilling breeze swept through the air, carrying with it the scent of blood and the end of our journey. I could feel the cold steel of Hank's blade against my neck, and as I closed my eyes, bracing myself for the inevitable, a single gunshot rang out. The force of the bullet struck Hank, and he collapsed to the ground, releasing me from his lethal grasp. Mrs. O'Hara stood behind me, a smoking revolver in her trembling hands. I found it in the sheriff's car. She stammered, clearly shaken by her own actions. I nodded, knowing that she had saved our lives. As we stood over the lifeless body of Hank Rowley, a dark realization settled in my mind. The message in the blood-stained room, You're next, was not just a threat but a declaration of the killer's twisted game. They had set the wheels in motion, intending to turn us against each other. We hurried back to the empty sheriff's station, intent on finding any clues that could lead us to the mastermind behind this nightmare. It was there we discovered the horrifying truth. The sheriff, a man we had trusted to protect us, was the puppeteer pulling the strings. He had orchestrated the gruesome murder of Mr. O'Hara and the subsequent events to satisfy his sadistic desires. With no time to lose, we gathered evidence and raced to the nearest town, praying that we could find help before it was too late. The local police listened to our story, their faces a mix of disbelief and horror. As we left the station, I couldn't help but feel a sense of unease. The sheriff had been well-connected, and his corruption had run deep. How could we be sure that those we had entrusted with our safety were not involved in the twisted game? Days turned into weeks, and Mrs. O'Hara and I remained vigilant, always looking over our shoulders, haunted by the fear that the sheriff's accomplices still lurked in the shadows. The investigation continued but the truth seemed to slip further from our grasp with each passing day. In the end, it was a simple envelope that arrived in my mailbox that would bring the nightmare to its chilling conclusion. Inside, a single photograph, 
A picture of Mrs. O'Hara and I standing over Hank's body, the smoking revolver in her hand. Scrawled on the back, a message that sent shivers down my spine. Checkmate. The realization hit me like a ton of bricks. The mastermind behind the game had been watching us all along, manipulating our every move. They had won, leaving us forever tormented by the knowledge that we had been pawns in their twisted game. The photograph has remained in my possession, a chilling reminder of the events that transpired. The fear never truly leaves us, and the questions still linger. Who was the true puppet master, and why did they choose us? Are they still out there, watching, waiting for their next move? The game may be over, but the terror lives on, haunting us with the dark, questionable, and terrifying twist that we never saw coming.